Welcome everybody. It's great to see you all here. Thank you for coming. We may have some other folks joining us as they come in in a few minutes, but um, I, we don't want to wait too much longer because we want to maximize the time that we have with our guest who has been so generous with his time to, uh, to join us. Yes, go ahead. Okay, as one of your hearing impaired members, I do want you to use the all right. I say okay. I Good. Good. These are old people in her All right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, it's our own perception. perception. Yeah. Just take that off. I don't know what to do with that. I just started on there. Um, I thought I was... Close to your own. There we go. There we go. I thought I was talking with my lecturer class voice, but I'm also still kind of congested, um, uh, getting over a little bit of an illness. Um, but anyway, yes, we're very happy and pleased to have everybody here, and especially with Dr. Stevenson, who can um, be with us this evening. Um, again, very generous with his time um, to share his expertise. This will be a rather informal conversation. We have not asked him to put together a slideshow or anything um, like that. He's here to just share his thoughts on the perception of aging. Um, and then to entertain questions and conversation with all of you um, as he goes on. Um, we also want to let you know that uh, there are a couple of other events in this series that are um, still coming up. Next Thursday online we have Melanie Romo on Zoom, also at 6 p.m., and she'll be talking about sleep disorders. And then on the 12th of February, on that Sunday, after worship, There'll be a light lunch at 11.30, and then at 12.15 will be the talk. Um, Pima Council on Aging is going to be here. Um, the theme is on end of life, and, and particularly with a great title called, I'm Dead, What Now? Um, so that will, and then, and then Pastor Candace will also be um, talking about uh, funeral planning and, and you know, how, to, how to help with that as well. So, this whole series, as uh, you probably have figured out or learned already, um, mental health conversations for spiritual communities ties in with our sermon series that has been going on uh, between Christmas, uh, Epiphany, and Lent on um, SAD, the spiritual affective disorders, and how we can uh, really work on that as a community. Um, and we've had two good talks already, and. We're really excited about Dr. Stevenson uh, with us this evening. So I'm not going to give a whole lot of introduction to Dr. Stevenson, but he does have a very personal connection to this church. Um, Candace can probably mention that at the very end. Um, but he is a uh, clinical psychologist who also has worked as a uh, business consultant as well. Um, and he spent a uh, number of years um, with uh, uh, Genesis Healthcare, right? Is that so, a um, great deal of experience and expertise, um, and we are very, very fortunate that he's here with us this evening. And I'm sure he'll fill us in a little bit more on his background as he gets into his talk. So, please welcome uh, Dr. Chris Stevenson. Well, this is good. I'd rather stand. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Thank you, most importantly, for spelling my name correctly. <laughs> and pronouncing it correctly. I've had the trauma of nearly 70 years of people adding an H to my name. And maybe at the end we'll talk about how I got the name of Christ, C-R-I-S-T. Uh, as time has gone by, uh, people are more familiar with uh, unusually spelled first names. So I don't have too much of a difficulty with it anymore. But it was just two weeks ago I got a call, and I, I, I answered the phone, I thought it was uh, the auto shop that I had uh, tried, started to make an appointment with. And I said, hello, the guy goes, I'm looking for Christ. <laughs> <laughs> I paused. <laughs> and I, I really tried, but I couldn't help myself. I said, have you thought about going to church? <laughs> anyway, yes, I, I am a psychologist. Um, I'm a retired psychologist. Sometimes it scares people. I think psychologists can be. There's a music stand. Oh, There's a music stand right there. Oh, okay, great. 
Yeah, I need to keep my place because I want to chase rabbits down to halls. It's terrific. Thank you. Um, I wouldn't say that I am a specific expert on aging. Uh, I am becoming a personal expert on that. I'll be 70 in uh, not too long. Um, my background is uh, started out as largely academic. I've been a doctor from the research doctor from the University of Illinois. I worked in business consulting for a while, and uh, about 20 years ago, I recertified, went through essentially a second doctoral program to become a clinical psychologist. So I've worked with all kinds of populations. Um, what I'm going to talk about is, is based partly on my academic background, and hopefully I won't bore you with some academic stuff, because I think it's fairly interesting. Uh, my personal experience, and I think my professional experience. And the personal experience is a big part of it, because um, I'm kind of going through what we're talking about here. So let's talk about, to start out, the biological <coughs> and psychological changes we experience as we get older. That's important because the effectiveness in which we deal with these changes has an awful lot to do with our sense of well-being and with our dealing with anxiety, depression, sense of vulnerability. But let me tell you this from the outset. I'm sort of an old-fashioned psychologist. Um, depression, anxiety, vulnerability, all that is normal. I don't, I, I think the worst thing we do oftentimes, those of us in the mental health field, is put a label on something and that becomes permanent. It's, it's one of those labels that can't be a lot. Uh, depression, anxiety, vulnerability, those are things that we learn hopefully through life to deal with. And some of the issues that we deal with as we get older are a little bit different, but it still is about those skills. So briefly, you know, the biological changes, we lose stamina, we lose strength, we lose balance. We lose appearance, uh, some of us lose hair, that bald spot is cold. Um, we gain medical condition, prescription lists, uh, a few pounds where we don't want them. And the, but the psychological changes are more insidious. They're, they're, they're more subtle. The good news though is that they are amenable to change. So the combination of psychological and, bio and biological really puts us in a situation where we lose a certain sense of a term, an academic term I'm going to use, called perceived self-efficacy, which goes back to my era, it goes back to the 70s, um, which is, has to do with a sense of having, another term is personal agency. A simpler way of putting it is having a sense of some control over our lives. Nobody can control their life, obviously. But having a sense of some control over your lives has a heck of a lot to do with your sense of well-being, with how you manage stress, how you manage depression, how you manage anxiety, how we manage aging, things like that. And I'm pretty much basing that on um, extensive research in social psychology. And this is pretty much the American tradition of psychology, which is very cognitive behavioral, uh, very research-oriented, and I, I am a big fan of a, a fellow who just died about a year and a half ago in 95 <clears throat> by the name of Albert Pandora, who has just published voluminous amounts of research and people like me and hundreds and hundreds of others have followed in his path in terms of publishing research in, in this area. And I'll talk about him a little bit, a little bit more. But let's talk about the areas, at least a, a few areas, in which that sense of loss of control, that loss of perceived self-efficacy, affects us as we get older. For some reason, the first thing that comes to mind for me is not academic, it's finances. When we're out in the work world, we're out there earning money. Well, even though you spend your life paying to Social Security and Medicare, we're then dependent on the government to give us that money back. So we're not as much in control of our money. It's, 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 it's sort of, a, it, may, it may seem subtle, but the difference between going out and making money and somebody giving you money, which some fools call entitlements, it's not an entitlement. We're getting a very small return on what we put in, but we're dependent on the government. We've lost some control over our finances in that sense. Um, some of us, if we're lucky or if we're smart, have a decent 401k. Some people have pensions, so I, I doubt very much if it's true of the next generation. 
Um, but you're still depending on others for a relatively fixed income. Uh, you can't go and work an extra shift or take on extra clients or work a second job if you're retired. I mean, you can if you want, but it's, it's rather difficult to do. Another area that's important is that sense of purpose. You know, when you're working, you can put in 40, 60, 80 hours a week. I know when I was a consultant, I had some 80 hour weeks, I was exhausted. But it felt good because I was being told, maybe not in specific terms, that I was adding value, so they were willing to pay me. And that's true of any job. They're willing to pay you because you're adding value. You're doing something that people are saying is important, and they're going to give you money to do it. And that gives you a sense of purpose. It also helps you become a provider for your family, your extended family, for your community, for your church, whatever. That's a hell of a sense of Excuse me, heck of a sense of purpose. <laughs> um, and that's something that certainly changes in retirement as we get older. The third thing that, that came to mind when I was thinking about this, and it seems a little idiosyncratic, is our role of life versus the younger generations. Um, you know, we do have to depend on them to build the economy. We're not, as, we're not contributing to the economy as much as they are. And, you know, whenever they screw up, well, that affects us probably more than them because we have less time to make up when the stock market goes down. They're funding Social Security. I'm not paying Social Security anymore. I'm retired. They're funding it. Okay, we, de we depend on them. Um, and the question I have in my mind is, are they capable? And in some ways, I think they don't understand what we understood, which is true of, I think, just about every generation in the history of mankind. And in other ways, we don't understand what they know. But one of the trends that bothers me is, um, is there increasing reliance on technology? I was listening to a podcast with Joe Rogan interviewing Elon Musk about um, artificial intelligence. And Joe asked him, I thought it was an interesting question, interesting question. he said, well, I mean, that's, that's probably a big issue in the future that we're concerned about, but what about now? And Rogan said, well, this is artificial intelligence. People can use, this computer is more powerful than computers I used in graduate school in 1980. I could do more on this than a computer that was in the size of this room, had several employees, I think they're called the old IBM 370s, and it had special cooling, and well, I don't know how many people remember that, but that was, that was horrible stuff. Um, and what does that do? Well, I think it makes you a little bit intellectually lazy. I grew up with a math teacher who had us write our problems and our homework and our tests in ink. He didn't want us to erase our mistakes. He wanted to see our mistakes. Because he wasn't as concerned about coming up with the right answer as understanding our thought processes. How did we get to this answer? My fear is that the emphasis, and you can ask my wife, maybe in education, is on coming up with the right answer and not on and how, you know, what you should think as opposed to how you should think. I'm very concerned about the numeracy, people not understanding numbers. It's the other side of illiteracy. If you don't know how numbers work, then you plug in a formula into a computer and you come out with a number. You have no idea if you even type that in correctly, if that's the right. And when you're in that situation where you don't have a grasp of numbers, you can be told any old kinds of stuff and you'll believe it because you don't really know. Same thing if somebody who is illiterate and is, is given information that means nothing. So we gotta depend on the really smart ones of the younger generation to kind of deal with that. Um, so here's the challenge. Given these, given these stressors, um, how do, what, what can we do to achieve more perceived self-efficacy, to, to exert a sense of control, a sense of control, in our lives. Um, let me back up a little bit and talk about what, what that really means. I mentioned the name Albert Bandura, who's a psychologist who I, I would consider the preeminent American psychologist in the 20th century, and I would be shocked if anybody here had heard about him, and I don't know if new people in psychology have heard about him, I hope they have. But he has, a, he has done a voluminous amount of research 
having to do with um, perceived self-efficacy and stress, anxiety. He's done it in multiple countries. He's done it with multiple populations. Um, the way social science works is that you don't trust the science. What I heard during COVID, trust the science. My, intended, my wife heard me go on and on about how that angered me. That's not, that's not how you become a scientist. You become a scientist by challenging the science. And hundreds of people have followed Bandura's work and have challenged because the only way you publish original research is by proving something is wrong or parts of it are wrong or supporting it. And Bandura is probably one of the more enduring um, researchers in the field. So even though I'm giving you an, ac an academic perspective, I'm saying, this is real stuff, I think. I would say, I was going to say 90% of what you hear is like research is BS, but let me be more modest and say it's probably about 50%. But he has a, a quite a bit of backing there. Um, I also, my dissertation had something to do with his work as well. Uh, and there's literally hundreds, maybe thousands of people who've done that. So that's how it works. So let's talk briefly about managing biological changes. Because that's not really a psychological issue, only to the extent that psychology and biology, you can't, sep you can't, you can't separate the two. I'll use it to sing later. Um, so, you know, your MD should be telling you this already, and most of you probably know this. I mean, you need exercise, good diets, good medical care, healthy habits, meaningful activities, and all that. But the psychological issue, the psychological changes are far more insidious. They're less obvious. <coughs> the good news is that they're more amenable to uh, modification. So, I went with three examples of psychological changes and stressors. The first was finances. Now, in part, how you live your retirement, how you deal with finances, has a lot to do with how you lived your life. But I'm going to borrow from a, a wise philosopher that my wife is more the expert in than that. That's a guy by the name of Dave Ramsey. Um, and he said, you know, you have a choice in life. You can control your money or your money can control you. That applies, that's most important when you're in your 30s, your 40s, and your 50s, and maybe even your 60s. And when you get older, though, it still does make a difference. Um, it's not too late to, take a, to gain a sense of control over your finances. And I want to give you sort of a silly example of this. You know, think of coffee as an expense, a trivial expense. I drink a cup, cup and a half of coffee a day. I buy uh, beans at uh, Costco for $18.95 for two and a half pounds. I figured out basically it cost me about 60 to 70 cents a day to drink coffee. That's roughly $250, $260 a year. My next door neighbor, um, like Starbucks, or as Dave Ramsey calls it, five bucks. So she spends about five bucks a day, seven days a week. She spends um, $1,800. This is where a numeracy is an issue. You know? it's, it, when you know numbers, you can kind of figure these out, things out pretty quickly. She spends about $1,800 a year. The difference in our expenditures and something as trivial as coffee is $125 a month. Now, you have a choice, too. You can take that $125 a month and go out to eat, eat dinner. Or you could do what I do. You take 100, which ironically, I take $125 a month and they put it into my mortgage, the principal of my mortgage. So I'll wind up saving at the end of the mortgage thousands of dollars. Now, my finances aren't so good that I couldn't buy a house with cash, but like many people, I have a mortgage. And Mortgages, car loans, things like that. Guess where that money's going to? It's going to the banks. They're giving you the convenience of, of they have the money that you don't have or will have in five to 15 or 30 years, whatever your mortgage, whatever your loan is, and you're paying out the nose for that. Um, ask a car dealer what their number one profit center is. Anybody? If you ever watch YouTube videos on how to buy a car, they'll tell you right off, don't tell them you're paying cash. They're not going to make any money off of you if you're paying cash. Don't do that, because they'll jack the price up to make up for the fact that 
they're losing the money they're making from loans. And the housing industry is, is, is about loans too. So those are two areas in which we just, you know, we, if we don't think about it, we're not taking control over our finances. We're letting them control us and putting us often in a situation of feeling vulnerable, feeling anxious. You know, I grew up in a family that was terrible with their money. Every month, the end of the month was an all-nighter. I could smell the cigarette smoke in my room, trying to figure out how to pay the bills. Is that really worth it? And really, the question is, are you going to control your money, or is your money going to control you? So, that's one way, that's one way. Oh, let me bring it up. I was a cigarette smoker until 1983. Uh, January is my 40th anniversary of non-smoking. Thank you, thank you. Can you can get a sense of com uh, compute how much money I've saved in the last four years? <laughs> I'm gonna say roughly sixty to seventy thousand dollars. Plus health. Plus health, that's right. Right. Um, plus insurance costs. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure insured people as well could have to be a lot more insurance, right? And medical expenses. So I've given examples of, very trivial examples of coffee and cigarettes making a huge difference in how you can control your finances. The obvious ones are mortgages and car loans. One of the things I figured out fairly early in life was always buy less of a house than you can afford. I think maybe in my parents' generation, it worked differently because back in the 60s, the houses people bought in the 70s and 80s really increased in value, but that hasn't been the case for it's better than renting, but still, most of that money you're sending in every month to get towards the end of the loan is going to what? Interest. Same thing with the car. Buy less of a car. You know, yeah, it would feel great if I could drive a Cadillac Escalade here. Um, I think the prices are over $100,000. Is that really worth it? No. Unless you got, I mean, unless you're a multi-millionaire, you have $100,000 as pocket change. And there's people like that, that's fine. But there's no point in doing that. You, you, you think you may be impressing your neighbors. I doubt if you are. They might be jealous, who knows. Um, let's get to the other big psychological change, and that's the sense of purpose. This, I think, is sometimes the most difficult, especially for men of, of my generation, Maybe not so much for younger people, certainly for my parents' generation. Up, in, you know, up until the 20th century, people worked till they died. You, had to, you didn't have much choice. You know, life was, uh, was uh, Thomas Hobbes, life is nasty, British, and sharp. Uh, we live in an amazing period of time where we're wealthy beyond belief if you look back at history. So we don't, work isn't, doesn't have to be our entire existence. And that can be a real struggle. I mean, I think we need to expand the, the idea of having a meaningful life, having a meaningful sense of purpose. It doesn't always have to be work. It can be recreational things. It can be learning how to cook. That's sort of my thing. Um, it, it just can be a lot of things. You know, traveling, volunteering, whatever. I had a, um, I had a, a doctor from uh, India, who I saw for about 15 years. Very bright guy, very hardworking guy. And when I was in my early 60s, we started talking about retirement. He was just a couple years younger than me. And uh, I, he said, what are you gonna do when you retire? I said, well, I'm gonna move to Phoenix, or move to Tucson, I really got for a Phoenix. Move to Tucson and, uh, you know, enjoy life. He goes, well, you know, research shows that men who, uh, retire like that at 65, lose their sense of purpose, and their health outcomes aren't as good. Now, I sort of bit my tongue on the irony of an MD telling a research psychologist about psychological <laughs> research. Uh, but here, here's the thing. Dr. Uh, well, I can mention his name, Dr. Narabam was a very bright man, very hardworking man, made a lot of money. He was a urologist in practice with three others. Um, his sense of purpose was completely embedded in his taking care of his family. 
and I mean his immediate family, sending his kids to college because MDs aren't going to get kids aren't going to get scholarships. Um, taking care of family members that didn't have uh, much money, taking care of patients, it gave him incredible amount of meaning and significance in his life. The idea for him to stop doing that, it, to him that just didn't compute. And, and I worked in, in, with people, with human services, I, you know, I felt like I was contributing. But I think he, we need to really think about, is that all there is? And I think a lot of people struggle with that. And I would just encourage any of you or people you know who are sort of struggling with that to have people sit down and say, well, is, is life all about work? Now, if you come from many generations of farmers like me, my grandparents on both sides, going back probably a thousand years, are all farmers. They had to work, they had to feed themselves. But that's not how we live these days. We have people who do that. You know, I don't need to go and work in the garden unless it's a recreational activity in order to put food on the table tomorrow. Um, you know, I'll talk more about the younger generation, but I, I think to, to reduce some of the anxiety, it helps to uh, try and understand what they know, what they don't know, um, and maybe mentor them in a subtle way as much as possible. And I am struggling with that a little bit, well, actually more than a little bit, but I think it's still important so we, we can really understand that uh, even though our, much of our lives are in their hands, that we do have some influence there. The bottom line, and you know, what I'm going to say some people may not like, is really we want to avoid victimization. We don't want to feel victimized by our finances, by our loss of sense of purpose, by the younger generation, by anything, by our annoying neighbors. Dogs bark at five in the morning. You're not a victim, you know? Compared to how people were victimized 200 years ago, we are living better than the richest people on earth lived a long time ago. Because have, once you're a victim, you've lost a sense of any personal control. And I've noticed that victims tend to try to take control from other people to improve their victimhood. That's a losing proposition. That, that, just, that just doesn't work. And then you're really left with dealing with your negative emotions because you don't have a sense of control over your life. Now, back to my being a having a cognitive behavioral academic background. That's very much the American psychology model. Uh, in the field of psychology, there's been, uh, for the last 80 years or so, a fight between those who come from what we call a psychodynamic perspective, people who followed Sigmund Freud, and those of us who are the smart ones. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the American model is very much lot what we call logical empiricism come up with a logical, definable theory, and you test it with research. And if the research doesn't support it, it goes into the garbage can. Uh, the, the European tradition is, I think, valuable in its own way. As much as I grew up with the us versus them thing, and I've had arguments with people who are very psychodynamic, I still use terms like ego and, and stuff like that. Things you can't define, they don't really exist, but they're, they're good words. They're interesting words. There is a, one uh, uh, follower of Sigmund Freud who sort of, like many of his followers, broke off and developed his own theories and has been very influential. I know in Chicago there's a, a graduate school of Ericksonian uh, psychology. Uh, a guy by the name of Eric Erickson who came to the United States in the early 30s. And he developed um, a theory which just makes very intuitive sense. Uh, he called it the stages of psychosocial development. And he said a different a in eight different aspects, or di eight different periods of our life, we have conflicting emotions. We're introduced to new conflicting emotions that we need to learn how to deal with, that we have tensions with. And those tensions are resolved in that era, but they're, they continue with us. The extent to which you resolve them is going to help you in the future. Um, and the people who can resolve them, they, they have, feel happier and they grow more. I don't want to go through all eight, but I'll give you just a couple of examples. Uh, the first stage is infancy. And he posited that the two emotions that children are faced with, even though they're not thinking about it, they're not capable of it, 
is uh, he calls it trust versus mistrust. And uh, a lot of that is not physical, but it's psychological. The uh, fifth stage is teenage. Um, he, he called that an identity versus confusion. Yeah, that, that rings true to me. Um, you know, what I, in order to have, have, I grew up in the 60s mostly, those are my formative years. And in order to avoid confusion, I think I became pretty strident in my beliefs in terms of being a rebel against the, uh, the horrible people of my parents' generation. Um, my wife will tell you I'm still a little bit of a rebel, but that's more personality that has less to do with identity versus confusion. And working through that is, I think, very important. It's very important for us even today to work, work through that. Because our identity, when we talked about things like, uh, you know, your sense of value, your sense of identity is rooted in that value. And when you retire, you have to work on what that value means, what your identity is as an older person. You know, I was kind of a mediocre athlete in high school, but I was an athlete. There's no way in the world you're going to see me go pay, play a pickup basketball game or a game of touch football because I'd be in the hospital for six months. And do that. <laughs> so those are things in terms of our identity that we have to deal with. I think most relevant to this conversation, though, is uh, the last stage, the eighth stage, which is uh, when you're 65 plus. And he said that the conflicting emotions that we have to deal with, the conflicting thoughts, he calls it integrity versus despair. Another way of putting that is the last stages of our lives really involve, voluntarily or involuntarily, um, a retrospective account of our lives. Was it a life worth living? Did we do good things? Did we make meaningful contributions? Versus how many mistakes did we make? What opportunities did we miss? How did people screw us over? Our boss, our neighbor, our parents, a sibling, whatever. The more that we work on that conflict, and I'm not saying we resolve it, the more we work on that conflict, we learn how to put it in perspective and accept it. And that reduces the stresses of, of getting older. The worst thing we can possibly do is to deny or, or repress that. Because it's there. And even when you're aware of it, it, it's there. I mean, try to understand it. Make that your new, your new purpose in life as you get older. You know, to me, my purpose is not going out and making a living. It's trying to figure all this stuff out. And I will tell you, even if you don't deal with it, um, it'll come back in your dreams. I, I am not a big believer in dream theory, but I, there are things that I work through, and if I think about it, I go, oh my God. You know, that's, that's something that bothered me years ago. Why does it bother me now? Because I haven't quite put it in perspective. And to me, that's a worthwhile challenge to do that. So, one of the things I think that's important is to, and I have to really qualify this, is to try to think like a young person thinks, as opposed to an old person. Now, here's the qualification. A lot of young people, including myself, were idiots because we thought we had it all figured out back in the 60s. What truly characterizes young thinking is an openness to new information, a joy of learning. I have to tell you, I love school because I appreciate that joy of learning. But you got to be careful that you get to a point where you, figure, you gotta figure it out. And I pretty much had it all figured out when I was 16. <laughs> this is uh, the late 60s. We had uh, you know, protests about civil rights and the war in Vietnam. And I knew, you know, I knew the rest of the people were completely idiots and I was right. Um, there was a, a Bob Dylan song that he wrote in 1964. It's not very well known. I'm not going to sing it, don't worry. <laughs> My voice is worse than Bob Dylan's voice. 
but I think it's a, an incredibly insightful understanding of how he had it all figured out and realized he didn't. And he wrote this when he was in his 20s. And the music wasn't published and it wasn't performed until 25 or more years later. I happened to see it on YouTube about three or four years ago. It was a tribute concert to Bob Dylan. And there were uh, several artists who would sing, each would sing a stanza of it, with, with, and it all had the same refrain. And Bob Dylan sang a, a stanza that just really sort of hit me. And you know how sometimes music stays in your head for no, or comes into your head for no apparent reason? Well, this one does a lot. He says, he, he uh, sang, In a soldier's stance, I aimed my hand at the mongrel dogs who teach, fearing not that I'd become my enemy in the instant that I preached. My pathway led by confusion boats, mutiny from stern to bow. Ah, but I was so much older then. I'm younger than that now. Um, like most art, I think it's up to the individual to interpret that for themselves. But that's really meaningful in terms of appreciating that it's important to try to think like you're younger and not like you're stuck in your ways, whether you're 18, 25, 75, whatever. So, uh, since we're in a church, uh, in the church that we were married in, um, I guess it makes sense to you know, say, what, what role does religion play in all this? That's not something I want to get into too deeply because most psychologists I know are pretty secular and they're, you just get into arguments. I will give Eric Erickson credit. He, he felt, and he wrote this probably in the 19, early 60s, that he thought that uh, religion helped people with the trust-mistrust conflict that they experienced the first phase of their lives. I think maybe in others as well, because to me it makes intuitive sense that the belief in a higher power, the uh, experience with the wisdom of the ages that you see in, in Bibles as well as in, in, in literature and other things, uh, I think really does help people kind of feel like they have a little bit more control over, over their lives. Uh, from personal experience, it, uh, it played a pretty big role. I, uh, my wife always wonders when we go to church, I start to cry during, during stuff. I grew up in the Lutheran church. Uh, went to Sunday school, went to the Sunday uh, services, even listened to a few of the sermons. I was in the Luther League, I was vice president of the Luther League in high school, in the junior choir. I also went three years to Hebrew school in second, third, and fourth grade. And grew up in a uh, somewhat Jewish neighborhood, probably 40% at the time, it was a 40% Jewish neighborhood. And went to, later on, went to school that was predominantly Jewish, so I like to think, you know, I sort of have got grokked the essence of the whole Judeo-Christian ethic here. And the one thing that all that did for me, it, I practiced this, so I, I wouldn't get to me. It gave me a sense of unconditional positive regard. Now, if any of you are familiar with uh, Carl Rogers, who was a rather interesting psychologist from the old days, it was, it was really the key to the key to helping people was provide one of the keys was providing unconditional positive regard. What that did was allow me to overcome, I would say, a pretty um, challenging childhood, and help me find a way or various ways to take a sense of control over my life. So I didn't have to do, I didn't have to live a life that my parents, my, my biological and my adoptive parents did. I created my own life. If you've talked to people who've immigrated here, as I did, from Europe, from Mexico, and other places, they describe that as the American dream. You know, being able to create your own life and not being forced into the life that your parents were. And I think for many, many generations, 
If your parents were farmers, you were a farmer. If your parents worked in a factory, you worked in a factory. But having the belief that you have some control over your future really makes a huge difference. And it's just as important now as it is when you're a child. So, just to recap, um, you know, how we perceive our personal agency, our sense of control, you know, is really probably more key to our happiness than just about anything. But it's important, I think, to disregard that youthful arrogance that it's so easy to pick up. And sometimes it stays with us. I'm not saying I don't have some of that. We all do. But to be aware of that and to learn how to moderate that and to change that is important. I think thinking like a young person who's open to learning new ideas, skills, new ways of looking at things, as opposed to someone who is defensively, and it certainly is defensive when you think you've got it all figured out because you're afraid of new ideas, new learning. Uh, I think thinking like a young person like that is extraordinarily important. So I want to I close with uh, the famous philosopher, poet, uh, Mr. Bob Dylan again, um, in a song that uh, it's much more well known. May God bless and keep you always, may your wishes all come true. May you always do for others what others do for you. May you build a ladder to the stars, and climb on every rock, <clears throat> and may you be forever young. Thank you. Any questions? Um, I'm sure there's plenty of them. Yeah? So, <clears throat> you, you mentioned kind of early in your talk about some of the cognitive changes. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that I found really interesting, um, I, I spent 20 years in the classroom with undergraduates, and I noticed from the time I started teaching into the early zeros up until when I left the classroom in 2020, <clears throat> that more and more of them were losing uh, critical thinking skills coming into college, right? So high schools weren't preparing them enough. They just weren't, they were just believing anything. Um, and they were particularly fond of conspiracy theories. And so I was working with them to, you know, to push back on them and challenge them and, and help them in that way. But what I've also seen is that with my parents' generation and with their friends, the same dynamic, um, where folks that I've known for most of my adult life who have advanced graduate degrees and professional careers are now in their 80s believing just crazy stuff. Um, and, and not only being susceptible to it, not questioning it, not using some of the same critical thinking skills they had decades earlier, and, and perpetuating it within their circles of influence in a kind of an echo chamber, mm -hmm. much the way my undergraduates were doing mm -hmm. themselves. Mm -hmm. And I, what I don't know is, is this something that just happens as part of the, you know, the, the life stages of people? Or is this something that's happening to all of us in society collectively? Well, first of all, I think uh, education and critical thinking starts at home. You can't count on your teachers to, to do that for you. Maybe I was unusual, but I read before I went to kindergarten. I, I hope that most kids did because that helps you. To be able to analyze information and use it, you have to be independent of the sources of information. I think with the internet era, um, we're much more dependent on the sources of information. And I don't think we understand how to analyze information and most importantly, how we learn how to tolerate ambiguity. Because we don't really, you know, I can read a, an article and say, okay, that, that kind of makes sense. I believe some of that, most of that, but a certain part of that I, I need to reserve. That ambiguity, though, is stressful to a lot of people. Not knowing the answer, not having a clear understanding of it is stressful, but being able to being able to tolerate that ambiguity is essential to being able to separate the, the chaff from the wheat. 
I don't think it's a developmental thing. I think uh, we're probably more prone to that. I think a lot of people don't have advantages of having a good education. I was probably extraordinarily privileged to have a, a good education, both public and, and private schools. Um, I was also privileged to the extent that I knew that was important. For all their faults, my parents thought that was important, and I learned that that was important. It's an absolute tragedy when parents send their kids to school and they treat it as something that they just have to do. You just need to get your high school degree. Then I've seen work, when I was, uh, lecturing, at, when I was uh, lecturing at Roosevelt University in the 80s, I taught a research methods class. These are graduate students. And I was talking about the philosophy of science, which I think is very important. I think you can't just be a scientist and go in and, you know, tinker with things. You need to understand what you're doing and why you're doing it. Like a good plumber understands your entire circuitry, or whatever you call the plumbing. Well, a good electrician understands the entire cir circuitry before it starts filling the stuff. And so I started talking about theories of falsifiability and this and that. And one of the students who I thought was one of my better students raised her hand and says, Dr. Stevenson, is this going to be on the test? <laughs> that was at the point where I realized I wasn't going into academia. <laughs> this was 40 years ago. 35 years, yeah, more than 35 years ago. So I think this has just been a trend. You know, we reward people for degrees rather than ability and knowledge. Some of that's changing, though. I, I think some employers are trying to say, well, I'm not as concerned about your degree. I'm concerned about what you're capable of doing. Because we graduate plenty of people from high school, from college, or from graduate school who don't know what they're talking about. And I'll tell you that's true of people with PhDs in psychology too. Sometimes I don't know what I'm talking about, but a lot of times there's a lot of people who don't know. They're not even close, so, yeah. Um, I was just going to comment um, on that. Um, I think that there's a lot of sheltered from challenging yes. ideas, from feeling yes. uncomfortable. Yes, I agree. 
and I think it's professors and administrators being chickens and being afraid to deal with students yes. who are professional victims. They have or that little ego going. Yeah, or, or, her are trying, or her trying to just create issues. I mean, that's their thing. Those are kids that probably become lawyers and politicians yeah. in the future. <laughs> you know? uh, so, anyway, yeah. I also get a sense that people are looking for places and things to belong. You buy into that philosophy, we're part of that group, it's us against them, it's a sense of belonging, it's a sense of being yes. with a group where you're accepted. And I think there's also a laziness. Yes. Um, it's There's so much information out there that if you want to pick something that you believe that you buy into, you can find a hundred sources very quickly that support that. Yes. So they say, yes, that's right, yes, buy into it. Um, and I think that um, with all of the technology and the quick growth of it, we haven't learned and we haven't taught a lot of people don't understand how to cipher through it all. So it's very easy if you have a parent or you have a friend or someone you respect that believes something to go check that out and then to be convinced very quickly because there's so much evidence on there. Whether it's true or not, you can find those resources. So I think part of what we're dealing with is the massive growth of technology very quick way without having to develop skills on how to process that technology. You know, one of the things that technology does on the internet is you can go to sites that just confirm your own opinions. Yes, that's why I just go to this. It's different. It's different. It's different. The, the, that's where critical thinking, developing critical thinking things is important. The, the, you know, you don't want to have people who are innumerate and given data that's total BS that makes no sense. And I've seen many examples of that by people who are quote unquote experts. Uh, or people who are giving you information that is rooted in just total nonsense. There's a lot of it out there. And if you don't have critical thinking skills, how are you going to differentiate? You know, there's sort of a related sense is if you don't believe in anything, you'll, I mean, if you don't believe in something, this is maybe where religion plays a role, you're prone to believe in anything. You need a firm foundation in your sense of values and in your critical, critical thinking skills. Well, and part of that, wouldn't your foundation also be involved with um, growing up with people asking questions, what you think about this, or how would you deal with that, or and doing that also as an adult when you meet people? All that interaction and not being afraid of the question or the subject. What yes, absolutely. One of the things, this is, it's kind of a silly side note, but one of the things I loved about the Jewish tradition is when you're celebrating a holiday, the oldest son asks, why is this night different from all other nights? Why are we doing this? Let's just not do it. Why? Ask, ask why. Why are we doing this? That's important. Asking why. And I think if you raise kids at a dinner table, that's probably the best place to do it, and you talk about things, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And you don't explode when you have differences. That was sort of the 60s. <laughs> um, you're teaching a kid how to think critically and how to accept people of different opinions long enough so they can see some of the value in the opinion as well as the value in their own opinion. Because there's nobody out there that's got it all nailed down. I mean, some people think it's Jordan Peterson. I like Jordan Peterson, but boy, there's a lot of BS coming out of him too, you know? Um, one of the better modern psychologists, you know, some people think Elon Musk is the next best thing since sliced bread. He probably is, but you know, there's a lot of BS coming out there too. He's sort of like Bill Gates. Bill Gates wasn't a scientist, he was a marketer. He's one of the smartest people around, but he's a marketer. He, there's a lot he doesn't know. A lot of he doesn't know about his own product. Uh, so we can't take people in authority as being, as not questioning them. We need to question them. Which is, uh, during this whole pandemic, every time, every time I heard trust the science, I just got so annoyed at it because that is not what it is about. We don't have deities who tell us this is what you should think. We have people who express their opinions. We need to be able to judge their expertise. When somebody says the science is settled, first of all, they're probably political scientists, not real scientists. Second of all, they're trying to sell you something. They're saying, don't question this, because the experts have already decided this is true. So, you know, if, if uh, I can't remember the name of the doctor, 
who uh, was famous for the malaria treatments. But the science is pretty much settled on malaria, that uh, malaria was due to um, uh, um, some sort of chronic infection, I can't remember exactly, some bacterial infection. And uh, he was like, okay, well, found out that it's due to mosquitoes who carry malaria. The science was settled when we thought the Earth was flat. And some idiot named Christopher Columbus goes and sails and almost falls off the edge of the world. I mean, if you don't, if you don't challenge the science, you don't advance as a society. And if you want to do that, you really, really have to have an exercise or critical thinking skills. And that's hard. It really is hard. You know, you don't need to be a genius to do it, but part of it is you need to be able to tolerate ambiguity and say, I can't quite figure this out, but I'm not going to buy the whole thing. You know, the car salesman wants you to make a decision pretty quickly because he doesn't want you to think about it too much. Because the more you think about it, the more you can say, what's this $300 charge for? <laughs> and you're going to wind up paying less. But a lot of people fall for that because this detention of, you know, of dealing with that, they go, okay, I'll go for it, that's fine. Tolerating that ambiguity will help all of us, I think, in the long run to, to decide what direction we want to go in. And it's never going to be this direction or that direction. It's not a binary choice. It's some sort of integrative approach. Which is why I tried to introduce a more European view of psychology, which in my upbringing, uh, my academic upbringing, was considered apostate. I mean, it's the idiots think that way. But by, and I think maybe these days it's not so strong, it's not so strident as that, but it certainly was back in the 60s and 70s. And I think we lost a lot by doing that. We're, we're fighting a fight, we lost the ability to integrate those perspectives. And we lost our own understanding of how much we actually use. Even though Freud was, in, some people will say a fraud, and he wasn't a scientist, but you know, his intuition, his intellectual abilities were amazing for his age. Now, their applicability, you know, upper middle class or upper class Jewish women who live in, uh, in Austria, in Vienna, was pretty much what he based all his theories on. That may not apply, but some of those theories are, I'm using, I use words like ego, like denial and repression and stuff like that. You know, if, if you reject something because it doesn't fit into your bubble, you're really missing something. You're missing an awful lot. You're missing the ability to integrate different bubbles into a larger one. Yeah? So you're talking about um, in retirement, or as you get older, maybe what I'm hearing is you have more time, you take more time to reflect, um, and maybe work through some uh, unresolved stages. Um, first of all, I would like to say uh, most religious uh, practices have some sort of prayer uh, practice, and to me, that's a, a way that you become aware of those places. Um, but sometimes they're not all that easy to work through. So, yes. do you recommend um, sometimes you might? Ask a, a, a therapist, or you might do, be a part of a group, or, or that kind of thing. I think that uh, there are a lot of there's a lot of really good self help books out there these days. Going into therapy is an expensive, time consuming process, and you're not really sure that you're getting a good therapist. It's a job like any other job. You know, you get good therapists, bad therapists, you get good teachers, bad teachers, good cops, bad cops, good ministers, bad ministers. And it's an expensive way to figure out whether you're getting anything meaningful. Um, I would recommend that, you just, that people Google self-help books from a cognitive behavioral perspective. In other words, what are the behaviors that I can do to feel better about my life? And what thoughts do I need to work on in order to be less obsessive about something, to be less depressed? Um, some of the simple things are like thought stopping. You know, people are, who are depressed or often say to themselves, I'm a loser, I'm a loser, this is terrible, I'll never figure it out. And you just need to say to yourself over and over again, no. As simple as that sounds, 
you need to break that cycle where your, your brain and your emotions are working together and creating something that's really, really negative. And there's a lot of good uh, self-help exercise books out there. Uh, I think what, what's happened in American psychology uh, over the last 40 years is they really have, and this probably because insurance companies have, have taken this up too, and I'm not a fan of them, but this is a good thing, uh, have, have really gone towards cognitive behavioral treatments where you can, you can, where you're clear about objectives and you're clear about outcomes. So if, if I'm an insurance company and I'm going to pay thousands of dollars a year for somebody to be in therapy, I want to know that they're not just sitting there talking about their neighbor or... And, and there's a lot of that that goes on. There's a lot of people who go into therapy and just want somebody to talk to. I know, I did that. I, I would say half the time, most, most of my time as a clinical psychologist, I, I did uh, testing. Uh, but I would say half the time I was doing therapy, I was doing therapy with people who just wanted someone to talk to. And I think there's more efficient ways of doing that. So can I follow up on that? <clears throat> Do you see any value in um, as a human being in community naming those places where you're questioning or struggling as, as an older person and having walk along with you and, and, and sharing that or, or is, it, is it really we just have to do it on our own? No, no. Um, and maybe church is the best venue for this. I started out um, doing group therapy uh, before I was degreed. And group therapy is not, I think, I think it's an incredibly powerful tool. I was doing it with adolescents. And you can see I did it for like almost four years. Incredibly powerful tool. Um, I think much more powerful than individual therapy. The problem is getting groups together is just impractical, almost impossible, but it's something that could be certainly done in a church setting where, where you have access to people, where you can get, and you, you really want to have six to eight people in a group. Three people, four people, that's not a group. You're not getting the appropriate dynamic of what a group can provide. And I, I do think that's incredibly powerful. And you know, I would recommend that churches do that. And, and hire somebody who has experience and the ability to, um, to manage the group. Because what you get from other people and what they give to you is just really amazing. It really is. Thanks. No, no other questions on finance? You're really smart people in this room. <laughs> you figured it out already, but you know, there's still a little thing. <laughs> well, once again, let's uh, show our appreciation to Dr. Stevenson for this evening. Um, and if you would like, we still we have plenty of flyers. If you want to grab some to give to your friends, neighbors, um, invite loved ones, your enemies, anybody to come to these. Um, upcoming events, even if you want to just take a few flyers and leave on the table at Starbucks next time you go, whatever you want to do. But anyway, um, five bucks. <laughs> five, five bucks. We are we are so blessed that you were here with us this evening, Dr. Stevenson. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, I, I think we have a few minutes uh, for some just one-on-one -on -one individual questions if folks want to as well. But we also know that um, we want to respect the time that you all. Marked off this evening to be here this evening, so we want to uh, to bring it to a close. Candace, any or Susan, any final words that you guys would like to offer? Just really glad everybody's here. It's kind of fun coming somewhere. Yes. <laughs> I was thinking when you were closing, uh, Dr. Stevenson, about the, the group therapy. So some of you participated this summer um, in some sessions that Pastor Susan led. Um, called Holy Listening, which we did both um, physically together in this room, it's also online. And as kind of an experiment, and both formats worked actually, and they were very powerful experiences of small groups. And there's a particular discipline for how you do Holy Listening, there's steps you go through, but it really has to do with, you know, being able to, to share what you're feeling and thinking um, in a very safe environment and, and 
to have everybody around you practice active listening. And so it really was an experience of that kind of unconditional positive regard um, that you feel in a, in a very um, intimate way with, with other folks. Um, so I think, you know, and that tradition of holy listening is thousands of years old. It's, it's hardly anything new, but it, it's something that the church does have as part of its tradition that can, it, it can offer to the community. So, right. Well, folks, have a great evening and, and be safe.